Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Stanti Tamya Nabhuta Lai Svayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Dadati Svam Padanti Kam Ma Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Kristaya Bhuta Lai Shri Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaurabhani Pacharine Nirvishishna Sunyavari Pastyatya Deve Satarine Panchakalpata Rubhisya Kripa Sindhu Vevacha Patitanam Bhavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaha Maha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Srivas Vigor Bhakta Vindam Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So just give me maybe 10 seconds and I'll return. So we'll continue with our theme about self-sufficiency, simple living, Srila Prabhupada's vision for the future of the world and for the future of our society. Um, everything Prabhupada wanted to say to us, he said it. There was nothing he left out. So we'll begin with this verse, Nadya Samudra Gire Gireya. Swananas Bhakti Virudaha Palantyosa Daya Sarva Kama of Anvritu Tasya Vai. Translation The rivers, oceans, hills, mountains, forests, creepers, and active drugs in every season paid their tax quota to the king in profusion. Srila Prabhupada's purport. Since Maharaj Yudhisthira was under the protection of the Ajita, the infallible Lord, as mentioned above, the properties of the Lord, namely the rivers, oceans, hills, forests, etc., were all pleased. And they used to supply the respective quota to of taxes to the king. The secret of success is to take refuge under the protection of the Supreme Lord. Without his sanction, nothing can be possible. To make economic development by our own endeavors on the strength of tools and machinery is not all. The sanction of the Supreme Lord must be there. Otherwise, despite all instrumental arrangements, everything will be unsuccessful. The ultimate cause of success is daiva. Supreme. Kings like Maharaj Yudhisthira knew perfectly well that the king is the agent of the Supreme Lord to look after the welfare of the mass of people. Well, this is a thing that is missing in today's society. Um, the leaders don't have this understanding, know they know what is good for the people in general, and don't and do they, they, they don't adhere to following. Uh, religious principles. So both the leaders and people who are being led by them are lost. Actually, the state belongs to the Supreme Lord. The rivers, oceans, forests, hills, drugs, etc. are not creations of man. They're creations of the Supreme Lord. And the living being is allowed to make use of the property of the Lord for the service of the Lord. Today's slogan is that everything is for the people and therefore the government is for the people and by the people. But to produce a new species of humanity at the present moment on the basis of God consciousness and perfection of human life, the ideology of godly communism, the world has to again follow in the footsteps of kings like Maharaj Yudhisthira or Pariksit. There's enough of everything by the will of the Lord and we can make proper use of things to live comfortably without enmity between man and man, man and animals, or man and nature. The control of the Lord 
is everywhere, and if the Lord is pleased, every part of nature will be pleased. The river will profusely fl flow to fertilize the land. The ocean will supply sufficient quantities of minerals, pearls, and jewels. And forests will supply sufficient wood, drugs, and vegetables. And the seasonal changes will effectively help produce fruits and flowers in profuse quantity. The artificial way of living, depending on factories and tools, can render so-called happiness only to a limited number at the cost of millions. Since the energy of the mass people is engaged in factory production, the natural products are being hampered, and for this, the mass is unhappy. Without being educated properly, the mass of people are following the footsteps of the vested interests by exploiting nature's reserves, and therefore there's an acute competition between individual and individual, nation and nation. There is no control by the trained agent of the Lord. We must look into the defects of modern civilization by comparison here, and should follow in the footsteps of Maharaj Yunastir to cleanse man and wipe out anachronisms. Omagyan timanandasya ginajana salakaya chaksu unmalitam yenetas mai shri guru vena maha shri prabhupad ki jai. So um, what we have explained to us here is what works and what is not working. <laughs> um, just today, of course, I heard it yesterday and today that um, because the uh, United Kingdom, the land of England, has pulled away from the UK or the UC, the, the uh, EUC, the European Union, um, now heavy taxes are being thrown upon any goods coming from there. And some places are even refusing goods to be sent from England as a, as a reaction or as a redefining of the whole situation. So what we have as an example of there, you start with a mistake, one and one is three, and then you add more number, numbers to the equation and everything after that is wrong. People are going to other countries to get things that they need when everything is provided by God right in the local area. Uh, and this is the, the sadness, or we might say the, the perverted nature of the living entity, not understanding everything is provided by, by God. But as is described in the Bhagavatam, in the story of Maharaj, Pritu, when Maharaj Pritu became king, prior to that, the rule was demoniac before he took over. And that was King Vena. And therefore, because of the demoniac rule, Mother Earth was withdrawing and withholding many of the natural resources that are needed to live. Uh, when King Pritu came, he saw the situation and he approached the personality of Gubumi, Mother Earth, and in an angry way, why she was withholding all her bounty. She explained because there are so many thieves and demons, therefore it was her duty to withhold. So therefore Maharaj Pritha performed various sacrifices and got everything back more or less to a saintly rule. And then the earth again started to uh, supply everything that was needed. So mother earth is the property of the Lord and she works completely under his direction. So when people are pious, and especially here, as it's mentioned, when the, ruler, the rulers of society live according to the principles given in the Shastras and govern in that same way, then there is plenty. There is pro, there's profuse amounts of a bounty that is given by nature itself. 
there's no limit. Uh, sometimes they talk about shortages in the world, but this is all due to the sinful activities. And although there are not shortages in some areas, in order to get the basic staples that one needs to live nicely, the economic uh, expense is only increasing more and more and more and will continue to do so. So uh, we don't need <laughs> people to tell us where we have to buy our food, what kind of food we should eat. Everything is given to us by God through nature. But because people live outside of the natural arrangements by the Lord, therefore there is restriction, there is shortage, there is problems, and there ultimately is disease. Mm -hmm. All these things are due to inordinate lifestyle and defying the supremacy of the Lord by not acting according to his natural and perfect direction for mankind. So, and we see that exploitation is the principle of how life goes on. A few people who have some position and some power are able to make a lot of resources for themselves and everyone else, else has to struggle like that and sometimes die in the struggle like this. So this is not natural living. And therefore, of course, it points back here to King Eudistir as being the, the uh, feature of piety because the Rajarsi, they're called Rajarsis, Rajarisis. Raja means king, Rishi means a saintly. Saintly kings who govern according to religious principles as given in Manu Samhita and in other Shastras. The Krishna conscious society is not, we are not a religious movement. We are a movement for the entire development of the world's existence, economically, socially, politically, aesthetically, morally, uh, communally, and ultimately spiritually. So if people mistakenly think we are just another one of the many religious movements, we are nothing even close to that. We are a movement for the re-spiritualization of the entire world from the inside out, coming from all sectors and all activities in all departments of life. Well, that's why you'll see there's a lot of emphasis on how we live, how we do things, just like you might find some religious movements. They say you can eat whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. You just have to, you just have to come to our temple and pray. And then uh, you can also give some donation. And by doing that, you'll get the blessings of the Lord. So, or they don't even include the Lord. And a lot of times they just say, you know, you'll be able to fulfill your desires in this way. But our movement is Lord Chaitanya's movement, which is, he is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So through Srila Prabhupada and Prabhupada's predecessors, Acharyas, and along with the present day devotees, it's about overhauling the entire human society where we set a foundation for how to live in all categories of life which are conducive to both happiness, health, materially, and a progress on the path back home, back to Godhead, which is the goal of life. So this is why we see there's a lot of emphasis in our society about things that are seemingly unrelated to spirituality, but actually are actually directly related to spirituality as the needs of the people on a day-to-day -day basis. 
uh, everything in everything is covered in the Srimad Bhagavatam and supplemented by the other Puranas and by the Ithihasas, the, the histories. So we have everything, but we live in a society that is directed towards sense gratification as the ultimate goal of life. And sense gratification is a selfish principle. Selfishness means, selfishness means exploitation. And therefore, we're experiencing how animals, especially, and of course humans too, are being exploited by a sector of society just for economic gain and the fulfillment of some selfishness on the part of a small group of people. So um, what is the solution? Can we wait for a saintly king to come in and reestablish everything? <clears throat> that may not happen <clears throat> for maybe for maybe decades, or maybe even longer. What we need to do is take charge of our own lives in relationship to how to live in such a way that we are not dependent on the external society for, for everything we need. Of course, that, that becoming less dependent is a gradual process. And we have communities that are actually doing that where they have schools for children that is separate from the society. They have uh, occupations for the, for the devotees in the community that doesn't have to, you don't, don't have to go to work in order to get some paycheck. Uh, but still there's ways of raising funds in order for to keep the society going, which is maybe in some way connected to the external environment, external society. But in general, um, we, we want to look towards setting up something that is viable, both spiritually, materially, which will include all the needs of the living being and all the activities of the living beings. So here, um, this verse kind of illustrates a lot of what we were saying. This is more like a PowerPoint from what we have been talking about in the previous days in relationship to cows, land, food development, and environmental, uh, what we say, efficiency, using the environment. And Prabhupada, in speaking on these verses, because he gave classes both in Mayapur and in London on these classes, on these, this section of the Bhagavatam, where he illustrates over and over again, we are products of the earth. Everything comes from the earth. So we have, if we are destroying the earth, which is the things, the, the, which, which is the foundation for what we need to live, we are destroying ourselves. So uh, the devotees have to take charge and see. Um, you, we might, I'm not saying that everyone has to leave their particular situation and go to farm communities right away, but we should explore the uh, possibilities of a more simplified lifestyle, which is more healthier and at the same time facilitates more of the activities that we perform every day, our devotional activities. Work, uh, work, to work hard is the job of animals. God has given the human society animals to do heavy work. Animals are meant for that. And they also help by replenishing the earth with their presence in different ways. Man is not meant to work like an animal. He's meant a dato brahma jagasa to uh, understand self-realization. That is the goal of life. 
like that. But if we are struggling in these artificial lifestyles simply to maintain the body and a few members of the family and to live in a very, uh, what we say, unhealthy environment, then a reconsideration means to think in terms of the future, both for ourselves and for the devotees in general, especially we might think in terms of our children who will be the recipients of whatever comes in the future. So Prabhupada wanted us to uh, very carefully understand the futilities and we are experiencing it. The thing is you can become so inoculated by the wrong type of lifestyle that you actually accept it as, a, as being normal. It's not normal <laughs> to not have fresh air. It's not normal to not have good food or healthy food. It's not normal to exploit each other for the resources that as God has so profusely given to the world. And it's especially not Norman, normal to kill other living entities just to live. These are all abnormalities. And the society has no answers because they're in the wrong direction. The only way this, the world in general will make a, a significant change is that when everything bottoms out. In other words, when their lifestyle actually turns in towards them and starts to destroy them, and people will have to reconsider everything. It's already happening to some degree, and it will continue to happen as long as we exploit Mother Earth for our own selfish interests or for the selfish interests of a small group of people. Okay, so we'll stop there and we'll open it up to questions. We will have to end at two o'clock today sharp so we have 35 minutes for discussions and you can bring up things related to what I spoke about in the last three days. Thank you Maharaj, thank you very much for such nice like alternate way of uh, living or simple living in that series, it's really really enlightening and uh, request all devotees if you have any questions and comment please uh, you can unmute yourself or you can post it now and i remember from like one of maharaj attentive hearing class that after an attentive hearing we should have either a question or realization so Hare krishna devotees over to you Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glory to Srila Prabhupada, all is to you Maharaj. Maharaj, uh, thank, Haribo. Uh, thank you first of all uh, Maharaj to give a, a wonderful series of talks uh, emphasizing on simple living and uh, how uh, more of our human energy can be dovetailed to spiritual life rather than the material aspects of things. Uh, so thank you very much for that, Maharaj. Um, I have a question. Uh, this is in relation to what we discussed uh, on the on the chat yesterday. Uh, I, I I believe that this is a something that should be done uh, from, from at least from my perspective and my my understanding and my belief. Uh, however, uh, I also uh, one of the two things is faith and courage. And yes, faith. I also think uh, and I commented probably will come from the mercy of Guru and empowerment from Srila Prabhupada. Uh, but how do we take the courage uh, to have that first steps? Uh, is there any way we can start with doing simplified living in where we are and then move on to, uh, or then in parallel explore this uh, alternate living? How do you- Well, 
you get inspired to move by when you see it being done in other places in a successful way. And that's already happening. The inspiration and the uh, clear understanding helps, comes by, uh, you know, seeing it's being done and this is the benefits like that. So it's not something that we have to create. It's something we have to just more or less understand. It's already being done. And of course, we might say, well, from my perspective, as an individual in my particular situation, then uh, that you have to try to intelligently understand. And you can start from where you at, you're at like that. How much of the things in our life presently that we don't really need and how much we can dispense with and that way spend more energy and time in the things that are necessary. Um, that's one way to start and then spend some time in these rural environments by visiting and getting a little bit acclimatized to what it's like in that kind of atmosphere. And then also we can learn, or if we have full faith in Srila Prabhupada's instructions, and we should, we can just go ahead and depend on Krishna knowing that this is the right thing to do. Uh, the courage can come just by uh, what we say, intelligence that is uh, connected to uh, to Krishna. In other words, what Srila Prabhupada is saying, and Prabhupada is very prophetic. A lot of the things that he said 50 years ago are starting, have been happening over the years since he disappeared. Um, Prabhupada had a when we say an uncanny ability to understand things according to time, place, and circumstance. And at the same time, because he was connected with Krishna, this is the main thing. Prabhupada was directly connected with Krishna. So Krishna knows everything. The devotee can know also much more than we can use, we can, we can develop from our own intelligence by connecting with Krishna, because Krishna tells his surrender devotees exactly how to do things and how to live. So we can also come up to that standard, but in the meantime, we can take take instructions and guidance from those who are who are on that standard, who are actually self-realized, who are showing the vision according to the instructions of Srila Prabhupada. Because these instructions of Srila Prabhupada are not something he's created. It's just coming from Krishna, coming down through the civic succession. You have to understand this modern civilization, which we call, how old is it? Uh, it's about 150 years old. That's all. It's some new baby that just, just came out. And now it's become the world's, you know, infatuation. Cars and machines, conveyances, conveniences, uh, accumulation. It's just, it's a lifestyle that has just developed with the Industrial Revolution, which is only 150 years ago, maybe 170 years ago. Uh, it's nothing, before then, people were living more closer to the earth, more closer to the land. What we're, what we're uh, talking about is something that is natural. <laughs> what we're talking, what we're trying to get out of is something that is unnatural. <laughs> Somehow we've developed this unnatural lifestyle. But, you know, but you, you see, I mean, practically speaking, and Prabhupada was saying in this and this morning, I was listening to a lecture in relation to this, Prabhupada said, you know, you, 
you have to you have to work to get money to buy the things you need so you you're working to get the money to buy but why don't you just produce the things you need directly instead of going through that whole process where the, the where buying the things you need also becomes a problem because prices go up scarcity comes in and all the endeavors to secure these things so you know it's it's just an inflation just keeps keeps moving so what is i mean it's just it's just common sense grow your own food <laughs> <laughs> we started to grow a little bit in this covid situation with the children uh, during the lockdown in the garden yeah you can start but you know we have places where you can grow profuse amounts of varieties of vegetables and fruits <coughs> and so whatever we have was just a, just a small indication of what we can actually do And of course even if we don't do it directly if we're, we're working in the communal then a lot of times in a communal atmosphere uh, a portion of the residents will do certain work another portion of the residents will do another work so there, there there's there is dependence on goods and laborers this is interesting because I can trade my labor in order to get some goods, and then I can get these goods in order to, uh, you know, take them and trade them to get whatever else I need. And the money system starts to just fall apart. You don't need them. You don't need money anymore, or you very little exchange with with any kind of currency. Everything is done by tra trading goods and labor. I have something you need and you have something I need, so we give it to each other. We have excess in that category. Or I can work in such a way as to produce something I need and then also, I can also uh, do something for you on a labor level. So these things are all, all easy to organize and they're all also been being done they have been done for hundreds of years. It's just a matter of knowing the, the, the process, that's all. Oh, thank well, you, Maharaj. Yeah, it's already being done, though. Thank you. Please bless us, Maharaj, that at least I can have some courage to take the next steps. Yeah. Um, we don't have to do it alone. What we do is connect with something that's already going on. It brings people together. Just like it says, there's a saying, it takes a village to raise a child. You've heard that statement before? Yes, Maharaj. It's not just some euphemism. It actually is true because children actually grow nicely when they're in an environment where they can have many, what we say, senior people around to learn from and to grow from. And that helps when all the burden is placed on the family, these nuclear families where you have mother, father, and a couple kids shoved into a box and it's called a house. <laughs> And then you just work hard to make sure everything is, and you're, you're just working so hard to make, and there's so many things that the kids need, there's so many things you need, there's so many things the house needs, there's so many things <laughs> your job needs. It's just like, it's just so much pressure. That's why there's such a high rate of mental illness in the world. People are under so much pressure to keep up this artificial lifestyle. And then when they can't do it, they take to intoxication or some other form of sinful activity.
Thank you, Maharaj, for the insights. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, it's practical. <laughs> <laughs> Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to Your Holiness. Um, Guru Maharaj, um, I have seen a couple of videos um, of uh, His Holiness Bhaktivika Swami Maharaj's uh, disciples. They, they have built some uh, villages in India um, for these farm communities, as, as a farm community. But I see them, they are doing um, like very, uh, very strict austerities, uh, like they don't um, have electricity, they don't use a gas stoves or anything. They're just cooking on fire and like very strictly they are following. But seeing all those things, uh, I got scared. <laughs> so well, because I'm... That's not for everybody. There's different levels that you can practice this simple living on. Mm -hmm. The main thing is growing your own food. That's the main thing. That's the foundation for for this type of lifestyle, growing our own food. And from there, you can take care of animals, you can take care of community, you can take care of yourself, like that. And everything expands out from there. So um, you can go as simple as you want, or you can go a little bit more in the direction of getting a few amenities in order to, sub to support the whole community. So if that lifestyle is a little too severe for you, then it doesn't mean that we can't practice this uh, more simplified lifestyle with growing our own food and uh, let me say, educating our own children instead of sending them to these. For higher education, we can send children to colleges and universities, but for the basic ed education, we find that children who are educated by devotee, devotee parents, when they grow up, they actually become much more intelligent, much more resourceful, like that. That's my experience with every, every child that I've met that were homeschooled by devotee parents. Mm -hmm. Because not only is it a positive thing, it keeps you away from the negative. The negative is what goes on in the outside world is education. Even if your kids are good, which I'm sure they are, they still are influenced by what's going on around them. Yes, good Maharaj, that's true. Uh, because of this lockdown and they are not going to school, um, even they are stuck with their computers all the time. Um, definitely a um, lot of unnecessary things are going in their head. But um, but take, as Deeptesh Prabhu said, um, taking that first step uh, um, courageously is the main, <laughs> main problem, <laughs> Guru Maharaj. So everyone, I, I feel that everyone in the family should have a strong faith on this process and uh, um, they should um, decide uh, together that we have to move to farm community or at least try it out for some couple of months like that in summer. Mm -hmm. so, There's another way of doing it too, which is a more simplified way with it, what doesn't require much change, is getting two or three families together, all who know each other, and then starting your own little, uh, what we say, agrarian plot, getting some land and building some houses on there, and then living like that. And then you have one or two cows for everybody. And then it's a smaller little thing. And you can practice Krishna conscious there. It doesn't require big management. Actually, under our uh, temple president's guidance um, here, a lot of devotees bought uh, acres of land, and uh, they are just trying to motivate devotees to uh, invest um, in that land and uh, um, for the future farm communities, Guru Maharaj. I think as this situation we have now starts to continue, we're going to have more and more uh, opportunities or more and more people coming back to a more simplified lifestyle. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm in a particular situation now where I haven't been outside in about the last week. And uh, 
it's miserable just being in the house all the time. <clears throat> it's freezing outside too. Usually I'm in India this time of year. I'm always in either Govardhan Echo Village or I'm in Mayapur this time of year. I'm in like November, December, January. I'm always in India. So I'm not you. Uh, I'm trying to get accustomed to this, <laughs> this what we say prison I'm in right now. Of course, I'm happy because I have a lot of devotional service activities that I can do, and I'm keeping my I can keep myself uh, well busy beyond the time that is available. But still, um, it's always a challenge with health in this environment. Extreme challenge. And if health goes out, everything goes. Mm -hmm. Mostly everything. Thank you so much, Guru Manash, for this um, uh, uh, classes. Uh, what uh, series of simple? Yeah, just don't, I just don't, I'm not trying to put devotees into anxiety or to force them into these lifestyles. I'm just saying this is something we should seriously look at in terms of the future, in terms of how things how things can can actually develop. And on the on the society level, there are many persons who are trying to make it happen on that level. But it's not enough. The problem will come if there's a major, major economic crash, and it could come at any time, where your money will just be, you know. And Prabhupada said, he actually said it, your money will be just like pieces of paper. You can use it for, you know, for posterity, put it on the wall and say, well, no, this used to be currency many years ago. <laughs> In other words, this paper money, there's a whole, you know, if you really want to hear anything about this artificial uh, currency we have, I highly recommend you listen to Srila Prabhupada's lecture. Uh, it's a morning walk conversation. Uh, you can post this on the chat. It's um, December 31st, 1973. Morning Walk Conversation with Srila Prabhupada in London, December 31st, 19, the 31st, not 21st, 31st, December 31st, 1973, Morning Walk Conversation. It's interesting, he talks about the whole artificial uh, arrangement for this paper currency. And uh, because actually you don't have anything when you have paper, all you have is paper. <laughs> That's why you have, because the government acknowledges it, you can get goods and you can get services. As soon as the government crashes, it's nothing. It's you are, you have nothing, zero. So you're working for something that you could lose at any time. Of course, we might think, well, the government's not going to crash. <laughs> well, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> I'm not so sure about it. We should be so certain that we can always continue with this artificial currency. That's another thing, too, this, this artificial currency. You just listen to that. It's a discussion. It's interesting between Prabhupada and many of his senior devotees about about the uh, about paper currency, gold coins, and actually what it actually represents in the day-to-day -day life. It's interesting. One of my favorite lectures by Shiva Paul. Now, it's not a lecture, actually. It's a discussion, which makes it even more interesting because devotees are throwing questions at Prabhupada in relationship to what's going on and Prabhupada's answering it and expanding on those answers. So, yeah, that's another thing, you know, at any time if, this, if the government collapses or if there's a major, major, just like in 1927, which continued for two years till 1929 in America, there was the, the, the fall of the entire American Stock Exchange 
so much so that people who had millions of dollars lost everything overnight completely. The suicide rate climbed to a, to a, a high proportion. People were, were committing suicide because they had everything they had was lost overnight within just hours. And so um, it happened about a hundred years ago. It could happen any time again. And those of you who know economics, you can attest to the what we say the instability of paper currency. It's really real wealth means precious metals and land. That's wealth. You have land, you have wealth. If you have precious metals, you have wealth. But try to get precious metals nowadays because the, the, uh, the big guys, they buy up it all. The gold, the, gold, the gold is already bought up. You can't even get into the gold market. Pretty soon, I think the silver market is also closed. Too. If you want to buy gold, it's like something like six or seven hundred dollars just for an ounce of gold. So, you know, so this paper currency really is pretty much valueless. It doesn't have any. That's one of the reasons why we should look be looking towards these, you know, these communal livings because if you have land. You have cows and you have community with other devotees, you can take care of all of your needs and more. Hare Krishna Maharaj, there is one question in chat from Madhavananda Prabhu. Uh, he is asking Can we presume help and support from Mother Bhumi? when we are trying to get going of a farm community. What's the, what's the first part of the question again? Can we presume help and support from Mother Bhumi when we are trying to get going our farm community? Yeah, because you're fulfilling Mother Bhumi is the servant of Krishna. It's Mother Nature, Father God, they, they are together. If you're working according to the instructions of the Lord, Mother Nature will support. Prabhupada makes that statement over and over again. When you, work, when you follow the laws of God, Mother Nature supplies. When you go against, she restricts. Or she punishes either way. The earth is a living organism. Okay, so uh, we have another nine minutes if we have any more discussion. Mm -hmm. Are we going to have Maharaj any round chanting round today? Oh yeah. <laughs> 